So, for the first agenda item, announce that the meeting is being recorded by two cameras <laughs> and maybe one microphone. Because that, that camera used to have a microphone on it, this oh. doesn't have now. So, I'm not sure if. Uh, okay, oh, we got we'll that one on here. And we have one on here. So uh, actually, actually uh, this is Catherine Bukusker. Yes, yeah. hello everyone. Can you, can you explain why you're filming this? Yes, I'm here because I'm making a documentary about how Northampton is responding to the threats of climate change. Oh, cool. Um, I've interviewed a couple of you, and I have plans to interview a few more of you. Um, I'm using equipment from Northampton Open Media. And, yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm really excited to do this. Okay, we're going to start with public comment. Do we want to make a comment? Lily, do you want to say? I don't have a public comment to make today, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> no, for the record. I'm Sharon Moulton from. Um, we ate evergreen. Sure, we'll start for one second. Now we not have our scribe. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, that's a good point. It looks like we don't. Can someone be a scribe? Sorry. Sorry. Should we get your words first? Sure. You're absolutely right. I'll do it. Thank you, ladies. Okay. Right. Take it away. Sorry. So you want me to start again with who I am, Eggner? <laughs> <laughs> what do you know me about? Yeah, right. <laughs> For me, yes. so I I was on a Zoom call of the um, leaders of the uh, Clean Energy Future Coalition, which is the statewide coalition to get a price on carbon pollution. And one thing that came up today was that the comment period on the memorandum of understanding about the transportation climate initiative is the deadline for comments is February 28th. So since it's not on your agenda, I think you can't comment as a commission, but hopefully all of you will want to um, comment as individuals, personally. And, you know, what the commission is asking for is comments in support of it and asking it to be as absolutely strong as possible. So what's the name of the document? Or the it, it, policy? It, TCI, Transportation, Climate, <coughs> if it, anybody would like me, right after the Zoom call was over, in the next half hour, somebody who, the um, executive director of ELM, um, Environmental League of Mass, she put out an easy thing for you to have ideas about comments and how to get it there. Want me to forward that to Chris, and it could be forwarded to all of you? Sure. Okay, I'll do that right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other public comment? Great. Okay. okay, I just had a motion for the, uh, the minutes, unless anyone needs amendments. Do you have any objection to me moving this now to the side? Thanks. Just watch the cable. Yes. Uh, there was a um, attachment in the minutes. Uh, last week, Darwin here said to come out and was referenced to the attachment to the CRP um, spreadsheet you had updated. That yep. wasn't attached, so I think okay. Doc received that. Okay. So I think it's attached to that. Okay. Yep. You can add that there. Okay. Yeah, probably meant to attach it to the final three minutes. Right. I was, I was, I'm just curious to see. Yep. Any other amendments, additions, deletions? Someone make a motion to put some in? Second. Motion first. Motion first. Oh, oh, right. Sorry, I thought you were making a motion. Okay. I'll make a motion. Okay. Second. 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 Okay. Chris, do you have any copies? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Just that. Any abstentions? Just no doubt. Okay. All right. Chris, do you want to lead a discussion about meeting times? Sure. Um, I just handed out um, the results of the Google poll. Um, we tried to find two-hour meeting times. The um, times I selected to, to put into the Doodle Poll were based on uh, when different public meeting rooms were available. It was primarily on Tuesdays. So we only have one um, one time on, on Thursday. One time did jump out, 
second Tuesdays of the month from 4 to 6. Right. Um, I, although I have heard already from a few people that since this doodle poll was done that there's been conflicts in that. So um, we need to find, I mean, do I go back and do another doodle poll, which then leaves us still meeting on Thursdays for one and a half hours? Um, go ahead. Yes. I have a question. So um, we can't we can't extend. Probably the simplest thing, of course, would be we could extend this time. But is it, but there's you generally not yeah. today, but usually there's a meeting here. Yeah. So right. the zoning board has it. Yeah. In these <coughs> um, they meet maybe two thirds the time. So sometimes we get like tonight they're not meeting, and sometimes they have light agenda items. In which case they can use my office. So the answer is we probably could do it and make this up two thirds the time, but they would get they would get first crack. But often they don't either. And we can usually anticipate what's controversial, which case they need to be here, yeah. or are they not meeting? So if if this date's best, we can stick with the date. Knowing sometimes it's not going to work. Right. Right. So you would know ahead of time. We always know ahead of time. Oh, okay. That's Zoning board's good. deadline is two weeks ahead of time, so we would know at least two weeks before the meeting. I guess the you know, I guess the drawback if we move the meeting around is, you know, for the public that might be confusing if we have some Tuesdays and Thursdays. I, I did put, uh, I have an ongoing class Tuesdays that would block all those times. Yep. I'm willing to miss it once a week. I mean, sorry, once a month if, if I need to, but I did want to try to see if there was a way of me avoiding yeah, yeah. But, but I will. We well, do that. and I'm not one of the people with the conflict. The second Tuesdays, the, the Committee of Disabilities has set the second, which my office also staffs, huh. has set that as one of our places. <coughs> so I, I think that it may make sense to be this meeting, knowing that two thirds of the time we can do it for two hours or longer if people want it, but there are going to be times when we can't find and it. And then when we couldn't do it, we'd move it to Tuesdays, which is. Right. So we well, can well, always do this meeting for. A, an hour and a half. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, partly why I wanted to be flexible about Tuesday is I'm looking forward thinking if we ever want to, if we want to go up to two times um, mm. a month, you know, that it gets even more complicated. So I'm willing yeah. to um, to keep the Tuesday thing in mind, but I'd like to, it's, it's, if it were not just a meaning goal, we could try the Thursdays and then sometimes maybe I miss it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Fine. I get it. Well, and just so you know, this maybe none of you may care, but we're in the process of hiring someone from my office, and once we hire them, they're going to take on the Committee of Disabilities, so then my Tuesdays become oh. free. So I'm sort of thinking maybe it makes sense to say Thursdays for now, and then we can revisit it once that time okay. is Yes. Yeah. So I could be open to Tuesdays. And is your class indefinite? Yes, it is indefinite. It's a, yeah, it's a class I pay for. It's a physical therapy. And so, yeah. Well, hopefully. At this point, it's indefinite. A challenge with sometimes meeting for hours and we're not happy it impacts our agendas and what we can mm. plan on covering. And yes, but we're always at least two weeks ahead of time. Oh, okay. so, so it's advanced on this. It's on schedule. Okay. Yeah, because the board has to be advertised two weeks before, so at the very least we know. Okay, Chris. Um, so I'm fine with that for our next meeting, so that would put us on March, whatever date that is, 12. Um, <coughs> And but and it sounds like you know you may get staff find the staffer soon and then we can do, could do it on Tuesday. Um, but is it? I mean, you you've basically put out all of the times that we have a space for. Yeah, as a month ago, and it probably hasn't changed because yeah. the schedules, you know, the calendar schedules are probably were kind of locked in. Uh, I'm just wondering if it's worth trying that doodle poll again or if. You know, at some point, you know, I, would look, I think it's very important that we have a, a longer time on a regular basis that's accessible to the public. Um, so, you know, we're doing temporarily, sure, but let's let's keep this in mind. Um, and uh, I know it wasn't, subcommittees weren't really mentioned here, so we're not going to make any decisions about those at this meeting. They're not on the agenda, but I just wanted to um, reiterate or talk about um, how important I think it is that that for those of us who have the extra time to put in, I know not everyone will necessarily have that time, but for those of us who have the time, um, having the time to meet and really, for me, I'm still getting up to speed with this. So I want to be able to get into the details 
and hear from other commissioners without worrying about open meeting law. So I think it's very important that we um, move on having sub, a sub, subcommittees, e even to start with, to make sure we're openly communicating about a wide range of issues, and then moving on to the more detailed work uh, that I hope we can get to. So I'm hopeful that you know by next meeting we can have something on the agenda to, to schedule some. So we can put that in, at the next agenda, and so maybe people can think about sort of as a homework, sort of what the what subcommittees we want and what the charges would be, so we can talk about that. And I think that um, aligns really well with my agenda item, talking about expectations and norms. So it's definitely something I was going to raise. So. Okay. I just wanted to also add about the, um, I mean, I, we can see how this goes with the two-thirds time. I mean, I guess the other option, or I'm trying to remember if it was an option, or we could meet twice as often, and perhaps we also get clipped sometimes. But if it doesn't feel like enough time, you know, we could right. try Well, last, last, I mean, last meeting, as I recall, and what the minutes reflect, yeah. uh, is that we had selected, we, we batted that around, and we went, so they chose, and, you know, the preponderance of the commissioners wanted to meet for two hours once a month and start with that as a way uh, to go. And I actually think there's you know benefits to that, seeing how hard it is to find one time for yes. us to you know to find for us to find two times. Um, could be Oh right, because the schedule here changes but this at this time isn't always open to every Thursday. Um, right. No, right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I, I think a lot of Thursdays this room is so this is kind of easy. Um, I'd have to go back and look. And what I will do, you know, Derek, your, your recommendation up. I'll go back and look again to see if there's any other times that we might be able to make it. Um, is it worth it to even to throw the doodle poll out again to see whether or not we get a different result? Um, uh, but in the meantime. Um, Strikes me, you know, doing the Thursday bit as we can. I mean, for me, I think it has to be a, a certain day of the week, month, and it has to stay that. You know, we can't bounce around. And we've explored all the room options, right? Well, I was looking, as I recall, and this was about a month ago when I did this. So as I recall, I looked at City Hall, uh, second floor hearing room, mm -hmm. and, and this uh, room here. So I didn't go farther than that. Does Forbes Library have? What about that room on the, in the basement next to the children's area? I'm not sure when they're open. Yeah. No. Library's open until 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. several nights a week, 6 p.m. other nights. There's also that room we had the Human Rights Commission that wants is it a community room in the police station? Right. Mm -hmm. they, they do. We handle all the scheduling for the rooms in the city. Oh, okay. But the police department handles their own. And they frequently limit, either because they have their own trainings or access to the building. Right. Um, so it's it's not it's not like four where it's it's more of a public space. Yes. Um, and there's also the senior center, uh, which we will sometimes recommend that people go to. They've got multiple different sizes and spaces. We don't handle the scheduling for that. Uh, you can contact uh, Chris, you might know, contact Marie directly mm -hmm. and see if we could put something together. Uh, but I know she's really ramped up the number of rentals and room usages in there since she took over a year or so ago. So. Okay, yeah, used to really limit it. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, you guys, I mean, my office is always available. It is very comfortable. We, we could fit there if we had this typical audience. We couldn't fit there if we had rooms filling up. Right? Right. So we use a lot of wards that are sort of eight people or less, and groups that don't tend to have more than half a dozen people coming. But at least it's a fallback for Plus, when he serves uh, snacks and drinks. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the rules. Wait, so Quaker, do you have a Quaker? Folks, they have a meeting room there? They could. I mean, there certainly are other public meeting spaces around, like in the school. Yeah. Do you know whether, any sense, whether or not we'll have two hours next month here? I don't know the answer. I, again, we don't usually, because the deadline for the planning for the zone board is 30 minutes <laughs> ahead of time, and Carol looks, we never have to do it. Okay. So, usually, you know, three weeks ahead of time, usually, if I'm not. So, it sounds like we are going to take a chance on only having an hour and a half meeting next month. Unless 
Yeah, yeah, again, there's two scenarios by which we could get the space. One is the zone where it doesn't meet at all, or if they have sort of a minor finding, in which case they could take my office easily. Um, it's the special permits, yeah. the things that are controversial we want to have in the space in case people show up. That, that was my estimate for two thirds of the time. They meet half the time, and sometimes they're minor things. Right. We're just trying to get a sense so the, so the commissioners, we're basically going to take a chance of not having the two hour meeting next month. That's, that's what we're saying. March, March 12th, one. Yeah, and then um, and in the meantime, I'll put out another doodle poll to see if we can still find another time that works. Thank you for doing that for a second. Your personal version to doodle polls. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Not to doing them, but managing them. Right. Uh, oh, we can also explore slightly larger array of rooms. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll look at a broader array of rooms. So next thing is sort of, you know, each month, there's extra copies if you want. Um, so each month we're spending half an hour on the, uh, the plan. One of the things, you know, I think, I keep saying one of the places where it seems like we're stuck on the plan is there's two ways to look at the, the plan. This is the, the resilience and, and regeneration. <coughs> one is how much this is about the the process, making sure that everything gets reviewed, that we're going in the right direction, and that I, we have lots of editing to do, but I don't think we have a big issue on the plan and on, on being able to reach consensus. The biggest issue, at the end of the only issue where we seem to have issues on reaching consensus, is about how aggressive our goals are for doing it. And so, one of the things that Ashley suggested is sort of thinking about what could homework be potentially for people. And so, so this is this isn't designed to be a list of homework. It's designed to sort of open the conversation, but if we were really trying to say we want to have clear goals that are more aggressive than we have, we have information needs that we just don't have an answer to. And so this is, is trying to get there, and whether we say, you know, so there's sort of three approaches. One is we say we want to keep working on the plan until we answer those things so we can have a better goal. The other is we want to move forward in the part of the plan that's important, setting up processes so that future capital improvements, future city budgets can, can address these things, and then we can always come back and, and add goals to the plan. Um, and the third is never put goals in the plan, those are more action, -oriented. often after a plan, we then do an action piece. So three different approaches, and so this is really the spark of the conversation. So, so again, this isn't designed to be complete, but so you know where our gaps are. We did a greenhouse gas emissions with a, um, a University of North Carolina fellow three years ago, lots of information gaps out there. Um, we then had a consultant as part of a regeneration plan who filled in some of the gaps. But there are an enormous assumptions we make. So the example I keep giving, so you probably heard me say this, is there are four or five permanent traffic counters in North Hampton that say how many cars come through there. Based on those individual points, Pioneer Bike Planning Commission has done models for how much traffic there is, how much vehicle miles traveled, Based on vehicle miles traveled and average fuel economy, they've done uh, projections for how much fuel is being burned. That means four counters are the source of how much gas is being burned on the It's lousy data. Now, everybody's using lousy data, but it's that kind of thing that we want to fill those in as we start filling the up. So, so that's the first one, it's the greenhouse gas inventory. We have very little industrial processes. You know, there's, there's some gaps that are bigger than others, Chris has great data, Chris and David have great data on municipal facilities and municipal operations, so that's the strength of the data. So some of the data is great, some is lousy, and most of it's somewhere in between those two. So, um, so, wait, sorry. Yeah, of so the, the actionable item for someone on this commission would be, would be proposing ideas to improve that data, or? Actually collecting the data to the extent we can. So there are better models that are out there. I mean, you can pay someone $50,000 and then give you data that looks better. I'm not sure how, how good it really is. Um, so we can always get better data out there, better models that are out there. Um, so it's collecting those things, and also our data is now becoming stale. So two, two different issues, filling the gaps in our data, and then you know, if you have a baseline, you want to know how you're doing relative to the baseline. We only have a one-time data collection. It'd be nice to do something even good or bad as the data. It is, it would be nice to do that data three years later or four years later and say, are we trending in the right direction? We don't have that. So if this is supposed to be 
a plan that you can revisit and actually meter how you're doing and, and all those sorts of things, then it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to invest a lot of effort in one-time data, data collection because you have to do it over again. I don't know what sort of budget is available, but you know, if I were starting from scratch on this, I would look at the types of data that are constantly available. I'm not good at scraping data, but I know people in the UMass Computer Science Department who really good really are. And the idea of, of counting cars when Google is perfectly good at telling us how bad the traffic is, that's the sort of data that they know how to scrape and could set up an API that would just give us those data on a regular interval, it might cost, you know, the, the, the price of, uh, of hiring a computer science graduate student for a semester. So that's, that's the kind of thing that's here. The short answer is we have no budget right now, but, you know, we can always come up with numbers and, and ask for those things. And obviously one of the questions, this is sort of a feedback loop, is to what extent does that data drive policies? So if, if we, we need to make decisions about our policy, that data may be really important. I don't want our data just to be the same. So that's, you know, that's sort of part of the feedback in the process. Um, and so in essence, what we did three years ago is where the data was easy, we got it. Where it wasn't easy, we didn't get it, which frankly is what we were supposed to do. Yeah. Or collecting data from utilities. I know it's been tried in the past with this big, like, oh, it's so hard they won't share, but maybe that's five, ten years ago. Is there any effort there? I tried. Every year, and I get nowhere, especially this national grid. Right. Okay. Columbia guesses is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, this community choice aggregation that we're interested in, that's yeah. one of the things that we're excited about, is just getting the data in addition to, to everything else. They have to share that data with us. Cool. Cool. Chris, are we talking beyond what we get from MEI? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Columbia guess is willing to share <laughs> from grid. Um, I have gotten, oh, from grid. Yeah. Um, I think I, I mean I think what's re being referred to here is everybody, not I've, just municipal buildings. Right. I've asked National Grid and I've asked Columbia Gas to be able to start with where we. Yeah. Oh, for municipal stuff, yeah. we could start. No, no, no. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. I asked them by zip code. Yeah. yeah. And Columbia Gas was willing to give me data by zip code for all national gas use, but it's not broken out. And the problem is the way they have their rate structure. Um, you, you can't necessarily say this is a large commercial establishment and these are small businesses. You know, they have basically different kind of categories of high summertime use, low wintertime use, etc. Um, so their, their rate structure doesn't break down into something that's easy for us to understand, but they'll give it to me on my zip code. Um, uh, national grid is difficult. <laughs> but we could compare numbers quarter over quarter. In that way, in we could. Way that and we could. We right. could start getting. There is. We can start getting citywide data for natural gas use. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, that leaves out propane and oil. You know, a lot that we don't have, and we don't know how many homes that we have that actually use natural gas versus oil versus propane. We, oh, we, have, we have. You had a really nice uh, spreadsheet yes. mm -hmm. of um, the assessors' assessor's data database. The assessor's database with. Uh, permits pulled yeah, for new boilers, new yeah, right. so with huge. I mean, yes, it, but it's we know it's got errors in it. You know, it's got right, errors, but, but we can. But use it's something it. we can use yeah. statistically. We <coughs> simply say, here's you know, here's a here's a sample. We build a model, and we leave. It, we recognize that there's going to be error, but we say on on the whole, is how's that model doing? Of course, we have to redo it. Right. But, um, so that, and, and then Wayne, I'm going to actually suggest, you know, it strikes me that, you know, for this topic that you just touched upon, greenhouse gas emission inventory, an action item could be to have a small group look at how the inventory was done, find out where there's possible places for us to improve it, and come back with su suggestions. That's a good question. So all these things are, you sort of following Ashley's suggestion, are these assignments that a future subcommittee, that an individual, that a UMass partner, that someone who a master's mm -hmm. wants to collect, and obviously, this is back to the cost issue. The lower the cost, I mean, an ideal world would fair with data we need. But obviously, the lower the cost the data is, I mean, it's not always going to be rational. If we can collect data easily, it might come to the top of the list. If it's really expensive, we might go back and say, well, nice but not critical, you know, or this is really critical regardless of the cost. So, so in terms of a subcommittee or an individual, I think it's both those things. What, what a method, how good is the data we have? What methodologies and costs for getting better data? 
And then equally important all that, how important is that data? You know, is it really, it's really important regardless of the cost or really important when the cost is low? So that, that's why these are all sort of agenda items. And some days they say, hey, we don't need this data at all. So it's good to each one in that kind of conversation, even though I'm hoping it's become charged for somebody else to think about. And so number two is important. I think I mentioned this in passing, but I just want to bring this up again. So just from a framework, Mass Audubon Society, who's really committed to good climate change stuff, um, has also said, we're in the business of buying land. We are going to sell our carbon offset. We know one of the best ways to sell carbon offsets is to have a, a wild policy. That we're not going to manage the forest, we're not going to cut the timber out there, and it's going to grow, and we're going to model what that is. And if you do that, you can model, this is my field, and I know the people who are out there who are modeling, you can sell on the carbon exchange. My own feeling is if we sell on the carbon exchange, we don't get to claim it. It's not really an offset. But they're big numbers. You're, you're leaving a you know, a, a six-digit number on the table. Um, and maybe if someone gave us $150,000 for managing our conservation areas in a forever wild area, which we're probably going to do anyway, we could make that money go further. And so I'd at least like to monetize the value of carbon, either, frankly, for bragging purposes. You know, we're, we're going forever wild in our conservation areas. Here's what it means to the city because we're really offsetting it. Or we're going to sell it to someone in California and we're going to use that money to get a better, better, you know, I mean, we want to compare those things. This is not my field. I know when you want to sell things, you spend a lot of money in consultants. You can't do it for fairly small things. But you can get, like a lot of things, you can get 95% of the way there. If we're just doing this for bragging price values, we don't necessarily need a consultant. That might be a volunteer thing. And so again, it's the same discussion. How important is the data? How good is it? We have most of our conservation areas in practical matter. We manage in a forever while. The only cutting we've done in 30 years has been um, for invasives, trees that are so close together it's going to be insect damage. We never do it for revenue. Um, and then we have, I mentioned before, we have two conservation areas which have the potential for a lot more carbon sequestration than just leaving them wild. Um, and then maybe other, I, mean, I don't know if that DPW's watershed lines, the same thing may apply to their land. It's not <laughs> so same question, how do we collect the data? Um, on both our conservation areas, but also just as an exercise. You know, this goes back to how aggressive we want to get. I still don't think, and I know some people here disagree, we can be as aggressive as somebody would like to get to getting carbon neutral in terms of actually reducing our carbon footprint. I think we could be for offsets. And so it would be a great exercise to say, you know, what would it take for to be carbon neutral today if we had offsets? What would it take in five years? And so trying to do some of those projections out there. So that's what all these questions are about. And again, each question is going to raise more questions, but this is a subcommittee look at these things. So, just off the top of my head, I go back to what Dan was talking about, about people in UMass who get a grad student in computer science or another department, or Smith College, or any of the five colleges who may be savvy enough with economics and or may have a bent in sequestration, and so at least be able to sit with us and sort of say, here are the issues. Here's what I think we could do. Yep. Uh, short term, long term, no cost, moderate cost. Uh, but at least to have that discussion. Uh, I'd, I'd like to throw go it internally. Proposal ish idea <laughs> and see see if it flies. So, I, I, as you guys probably know, I'm a PI on the Clean Energy Extension at UMass, or, or more extension. At least partly funded by DOER, which means we have a relationship with them. And they have some money to spend on some things, and obviously, especially in the Green Communities Program, they have a reason to partner with the <laughs> cities. If we were to make a pitch to say that Northampton would like to demonstrate what can be done, and like to fund a grad student through CEE, maybe get the OER to kick in some money on these questions, so we come up with, with our, our homework here is how do we, how do we really ask the right questions that we really care about that are really going to drive policy to help us. And then see if we can't actually get that person's work funded by somebody else. <laughs> I think that's great. I think there's still some earlier steps. So yeah. I think grad students are great answering questions and not always asking what the questions Correct. are. And you like Paul Cardoza, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, in natural resources has done a lot of work in this area. 
So even like figuring oh, out the right Kat Zara. Was that? Kat Zara. Kat Zara. Okay. So even figuring out the right. Again, this is not my space, but um, and and part of this is why I keep blaming Ashley for, for this assignment. I don't think we can necessarily do this as a committee as a whole. So I'm hoping this is some subcommittee or individual or Ben can take us all on. You know. <laughs> no, but I, but I might be able to create some linkages. Yeah. That aren't there. Um, okay, so next one. So next one, again, these are, you know, this is, don't overthink this, this is five minutes of brainstorming. But the next one is just sort of, what are all the questions for the thermal load issues? So we convened, you know, as, when ADA came to my office, Community Development Block Grant also came to my office, and so we asked the question of saying, what if every time the city puts significant money into affordable housing, we require buildings to be fossil fuel free, not carbon neutral, we, PDPC has already been doing something, getting affordable housing developers to think about um, making buildings more efficient. We convened them, and Ben came along as our expert and said, what, is this, what does this look like? And they all said, and correct me if I was wrong, when it comes to heating and cooling, we think we're mostly there and are willing to be there. When it comes to domestic hot water, we don't think we're there. And, and more importantly, we're not willing to try anything. <laughs> so so I, I want to say two things. In Ben's defense, and I won't try anything. In their defense, one of the questions they said is, "Anybody doing this in the Commonwealth?" And Ben said, "No." So, at what point do we want to be the bleeding edge? But, but I, so, so how do we ask those questions? This is I don't know the space at all. I don't know any space. But you know, how do we ask? This? So, these were a series of questions I think we have. And that's why I separated heating and cooling, where I think we're mostly there, from non-heating and cooling. When we talk about what our goals are in the plan. I think there's been some confusion in the community, not so much this committee, between what's the goal for the community versus what's the goal for, for public buildings. Because public buildings are expensive, but at least we could do that. If we have the political will, we could do it. We have less control of the private buildings. So I, I tried to break these questions down to what's the cost for public buildings and the councilors have to find money for us and we can solve it, versus what's the cost for private buildings and I'm not sure what the solution is for doing it. Um, but Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Partially. So when, when, when it's time for me to do okay. a little thing, okay. it covers this. So, so think about three when Dan presents, and there may be different questions coming out, but it's, yeah. that's the space I'm trying to get is, is the stuff that's your expertise been. But, but again, I'm trying to quantify it on what these things really are. Um, you know, and even block rent, you know, the one thing we control, block rent, you know, the total block rent allocation is $7,000. Uh, and CPA is a million dollars, a small percentage goes affordable housing, and it almost always will match in other funding 10 to 1. So we are a bit player. You know, so $5 million project, $10 million project, $20 million project, we put $600,000 in, which seems like a lot of money, but we're still a tiny, you know, we, we're, we're the tail wagging the dog, and so we're limited in the process. Okay, so that's that broad yeah. question. Um, I don't want to get too into the details, but for, you mentioned hot water as a place where they, they you know, there the, the, wasn't interest. Is, are there still programs to do solar hot water? Yeah. That and is that would that be applicable? They're just yeah. not willing. It's know? the size of the building. I mean, they're, they're, they're tanks. You know, anyone can do this for a single-family home. It's if you're doing a building the size of a lumber yard. Actually, solar economics are better. Solar thermal economics are better for. Like, a multi-family building where the, what you have is, is a large hot water demand that's con consistent with the relatively you know, consistent compared with a fluctuating heating demand, which is a larger portion of, say, a single family. So in that case, do we think it's more of an education issue? Than, than so one of the things I do want in all the data is I want to think about how do we get broad buy-in. I have an incredible respect for Ben, but what they tell me is, look, you know, the, the North Commons building, they hired a team who's out there, hired a team of architects who really believe in this. They're using Passive House Standard, which is a really aggressive standard that they clearly have in their blood. They're still convinced it doesn't work for doing it. And so how do we get data that, that you know, it's that whole thing that we talk about now in our current president, that we can have different views, we should have different data, different facts. You know, how do we get facts that we all agree on the same thing? So it's whoever they're advising and Ben should be sitting down together and I'll believe yeah. them all collectively. But, 
But their conditions, the numbers aren't there based on their advisors. I see. Thank you. Is that a fair topic? I, just, I wasn't clear who their advisors was. It seemed like a lot of it had to do with um, the, the limitations on what they could put into their, their budget models and also the inability to uh, benefit. They, would, they, they basically could not benefit from saving energy because if their cash flow was too good, then they couldn't get all the matching. <laughs> so so they, they actually had to avoid reducing their uh, operating costs, or it would take away their ability to get matching grants. I think you're right, it makes it more complicated, but I, think, I mean, certainly uh, the, the project that TCB is doing the state hospital. It has to have, you know, it's going to dramatically reduce heating and cooling, and somehow they can make that work. <coughs> yeah, in the model. We're doing it. But, um, yeah, it's, it is a bizarre space. I think. It's okay. So, you know, that, that, those are the series of questions again. We're not going to go to. Um, and then, sort of, the next thing is about transportation. Transportation, in some ways, is more complicated, if you will, in the sense that. Building performance, you know, the more we all know this, the thicker the walls are, the better the systems are, the less energy use th that there is. For transportation, the land use pattern is directly related to transportation systems. So it's not just about more efficient vehicles and more efficient walking, it's also yeah. about what's walkable and what's, what's driveable. So again, the series of questions here, but I, I deliberately put electrification are the last steps in the process. We want to think about what, just like everything else, we always want conservation before electrification, in the case of transportation, we always want reduction, you know, avoidance, minimization, mitigation. But same same basic ideas in the process. I'm sure this list could be twice as long. So what what are the questions associated with port? So what, for example, would it take to get, you know, we, there's a number that a lot of people use, it's a really bad number, that most people will walk a quarter of a mile, the majority of people walk four tenths of a mile, and lots of people walk six tenths of a mile. But it's a total law. Because if the infrastructure is great, you walk further. If it's beautiful elm trees and you like to walk, you might walk a mile. And if it's crap, you might walk 100 feet um, for doing it. And so what are the, how do we codify those walks? What are the, you know, there are places people won't walk because they don't feel comfortable crossing. And if driving is too easy, you are you'll drive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, so both directions out there. Um, so, you know, what are the, yeah, so, so all those things, what are the investments that, Pay back. None of these can, you know, these aren't the exact numbers, but you know, we can come up with better numbers. That, um, you know, in in our field, in David and Chris's field, we talk about life cycle costs. What are the things, the investments in sidewalks that actually reduce people's drive? You know, and it's an overall life cycle cost. So it's sort of switching to that. Could you also throw in here something about parking and the cost of parking? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's sort of what Aiden was saying in terms of the easier it is to park right important. for it. Yeah. So there's direct cost, and then there's the induced that you do it, so. Yeah. And this is an area, some of these areas are going to be more literature search. We're not really going to do a detailed Northampton specific piece, but we might say, again, making this up, I don't know, we might say if parking was at $2 an hour instead of $1 an hour, you should expect to make this up. A five percent reduction in driving, but you should also respect a two percent reduction in people spending money in local businesses. You want to, you want to solve all those things. So. so those are the kind of questions. So again, a committee who identifies those questions, the research that's out there. Um, and for all these things, I do want to keep thinking about the difference between city operations and private operations, because again, we control city operations. You know, we have total control on. The inspection vehicles, the building inspector uses. We have more limited control on the bulldozers that the BBW use, because as far as I know, it's not good. Okay. We also have some control in terms of ordinances that can affect private land. Um, and I would like to better understand one of the limits of those. Um, you know, for example, we can ban single use plastic bags. But I don't think we're allowed to put a charge on that because that would be a tax at only state level. Who yeah. would be a fee? Maybe. I mean, what's the difference between a tax and a fee? Tax goes to general revenue and it's not related to your costs. Fees have to be directly related to your costs. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of questions 
you know, just for example, can we mandate that a business charge something even though they get the money? Yep. You know, for example, a bag yep. has to cost this much. Um, the, the, you know, the, but let's take that on lots of different levels. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't heard back from them. I don't think it's going to be successful, but I, you know, I emailed our city solicitor to say, we know we can't do a carbon tax. Could we do a carbon fee that, you know, here's the things that have direct impact in city operations, just to accept we're recovering the impacts on our operations. Well, like the sewage, so these uh, sewer water. Yeah, well, I think there's a specific water. statute about the stormwater fee, which makes it easier because this legislature is specifically efficient. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I think those are all good questions. Yeah, and so that's something, I mean, like, that's almost a separate issue, a separate committee could yep. could investigate how, what can we actually do. Yeah, that may, be, that may be how you pay for any number of things, mm -hmm. if, if they're all related. So, wait, wait I just want to uh, add in here, since we've got the topic um, up right now, you've got these blank spaces on the bottom. I assume that means you're looking for yes. a new category. Right, so I, well, see, I, wanted, I wanted to stress that this was my five minute brainstorm and it wasn't designed to be complete. Let's do the last one on this list and let's go on to that. I just wanted to capture, Jared basically just spoke to this. Oh yeah, okay. So two, two of them would be waste, which is not a list of the, so just, you know, how is waste treated? Could be yep. another category yep. on here. And the other one you said, which you may want to be a category or not, was just what power do we have with ordinances and, and local, yep. you know, where is our local control? So that could be a separate category. Yep. Well. And, and, and one of the things that I'm going to raise certainly is this is sort of the business argument that you know, things do have consequences in businesses. So parking's a good example. You know, no question having higher parking fees discourages people from coming, you know, from driving. But no question if you interview people on Conn Street and King Street and uh, Northampton Crossing, where it's called in, in Hadley, a lot of those were businesses that used to be downtown. We asked them, why did they move? They said, because parking became too difficult. And so we, we want to have those numbers. Where, you know, what are the real things? Everybody is shrimp, right? Everyone is... The world, everyone sees things through their lens, so we're trying to have real numbers. All right, so last one on my list before we get to other brainstorming is just sort of what are renewable energy costs? So, you know, we've had conversations about where do we allow solar PV? I'm not going to reopen those here, but this has come up before in the committee. If you're, you know, we don't want to lose prime farmland, we don't want to lose, uh, you know, mature forests, what are the places where it makes sense? What are the, what are the trade offs, the pluses and minuses? Um, we know that there are enormous costs to make the grid a two-way grid, um, enough so that you know the first PV provider comes in and it works, and the second PV provider has much greater costs because they're responsible to cover grid's costs to make the grid two ways. We don't really know what some of those, those full costs as we go forward. You know? If we were generating another 30 megawatts of power in Northampton, what would, that, what would the cost be? And are we ever, is ratepayers ever willing to cover them? Or do we always want to be covered by a project? So, um, what else are, What else should be on the list? You said waste. Do you want, do you want to expand on that? Well, I can just brainstorm on composting requirements, reduction of waste in terms of you know, for example, replacing one single-use plastics with compostable equivalents. Um, if there, it mentions, you know, like the wastewater treatment plant, uh, the amount of energy that that uses. So those are just some thoughts. The Evanston, Illinois plan, which I really enjoyed reading, um, had some good, good, just sort of a list of all the ways that they are working on on weight and reducing waste. So I recommend looking. There are a lot of plans or have zero waste targets. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, exactly. Boston Moving and Cambridge. Toward a zero waste. Is there a big educational component? Like a, do the, do the, because I think there's a right. little bit of, right. There should, there should be at there every step. Be. Certainly. Yeah, people don't really know how to properly dispose of things. So. Yeah, and so having good materials uh, to educate. I mean, in my mind, you really need to have like the manufacturers need to take their products back. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's, you're trying to train people to recycle right is incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's the question what are the things that we control right. versus not control? Yeah. Right. Right. A lot be of it is hard. Right. Right. It would be hard for us to control, but that's what you can look into what, what can we have, what, what do we have control over. 
And then, then we'll also scope to mandate organics. Yep. I think that would be one of the easiest places and, to start and required um, food waste diversion. And at the moment, you know, uh, at, at, at the moment the city doesn't have, uh, have trash collection itself, you know, we contract out. So, you know, is that something the city, because the city would then have more control. Mm -hmm. um, how much they charge for it, stuff like that. So that might be something to look at. Right, and that's why, so, so two things, each of these, every single category needs two feedback loops. So what are the costs, both financial costs and policy costs? Um, and then this goes back to the first thing about the greenhouse gas emissions and what's the benefit, right? So a cost that has a dramatic impact is absolutely worth it. A cost that has negligible impact isn't that. I'm not, I'm not sure our greenhouse gas emissions inventory is good enough to even answer those things. I mean, we know that buildings, you know, do an enormous investment in buildings and save for greenhouse gases. We don't know about some other. So this gets into which scope of emissions we're talking about, right? Because if yeah. we're talking about products coming into our community and then leaving in some form or another, the life cycle of those products might actually have quite a large greenhouse gas emissions associated. Right. And, you know, so do we choose to account for that? You know, so that would make a difference as to whether you think it's effective or not. And we had this conversation last time that most of these doing these efforts are focused on scope one and two. Yeah. Uh, and, and scope three is often just let's do some education to encourage people not to buy crap from China. But yeah. yeah, related to education, where does behavior fit into this? In terms of cost benefit for so much they already know how to do and just some social norm shifting. Think of getting our kids to school. Yeah. How many people drive one mile to sit traffic to drop yeah, their yeah. kids off? So we know it's incredibly important, and everybody lists to that as one of the cross cutting processes, but we don't know the same thing in terms of dollar for dollar. If I spend an extra dollar in education, what's the impact? And that, that would probably be the answer from the literature. You know, right. how effective is it? Education or other, other ways to influence social norms. That's that's the thing is I just don't think education by itself. Yeah. But this is an opinion. <laughs> I just don't think education by itself gets you very far because yeah. basically you find people like you who will ride your bike everywhere. But I know a lot of people who own bikes and know how to ride them. Well, that turns <laughs> into other you know social motivation. So you need to build influence. beyond education. You need to to look at what are. What are the barriers? What are the, the things that allow people to form habits? Um, you know, what uh, what are the things that cause people to not form those habits? You know, so that it just to I think behavior is a good target. I think education by itself. Yeah, I like the, the concept of habits instead of education. It's much more inclusive, and it's something I think. I mean, if we're trying to change how we consume, I mean, that's we're so ingrained in, in, in the ways of doing things. We need to change habits. So, how does that fit into here? I mean, of course, education can fit into each one of these topics, but if we're looking at cost-benefit as kind of the overall question we're asking for every topic. I think it's another question to ask, of trying to, from the literature, to what extent, what is the cost-benefit for those things? Or identifying best practices, yeah. like what sorts of yeah. campaigns. Yeah. I'm just thinking, I think, that a successful habit-changing programs or work, whatever it is, you know, reward systems, those will have a much better cost benefit because we're changing people's actions. And I also I think we're all saying the same thing, but education broadly defined. Part of it is telling you the facts, but part of it is shock. You know, if we make recycling easier, do people then recycle more? And that to me is as much education as the brochure that we give out. You know, what, you know make a, making the easy choice the good choice is what we want to do. You know, the, the easy path. So is that a separate topic? Is, is changing habits and behaviors a topic? I think it's both. I think understand what the literature says in terms of straight education to require it, but it's going to be cross kind of thing as well. I so think it makes sense to add that as a, as a category. In each, in each of these categories, yeah. you had a question, which is what are the behaviors involved? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how could they, how, how, what, you know, what are they, how could they be modified, and what are the barriers to changing the source of social norm. And for each one of these, it's going to be different. Yeah. So I'm just mindful of time. So we're not going to get too much further than this. So this is more sort of 
maybe some this is to ponder between now and the next meeting or whenever we do subcommittees to think about which these things are assignable to all to Ben or to somebody else. <laughs> um, I mean, we could potentially take some of these. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, do so again, if we're doing subcommittees, that's probably a broader conversation. If there's individuals who want to do this, I mean, each of these could be developed further. So that makes sense to think who wants individually to do this and then separately form more formal subcommittees later. Wait, so I mean, as far as forming subcommittees, you know, kind of a long-lasting subcommittees, couldn't it be right now if we had two people in here that want to meet on one of these topics? Just let them know. Send me an agenda. 48 hours in advance in a public place you're going to meet, and I'll post it. And and take, be committed to taking minutes as well. And be committed to taking minutes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be, I don't think it has to be as formal as, as organizing subcommittees. I think it has to be. Yeah, yeah, as long as we're doing the process. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm, all right. Um, so, another committee that, uh, so I'm on the Community Resources Committee of the City Council, yep. and um, Planning, zoning, sustainability, that's what indicates scope. And so I'm wondering, you know, what charges would we want to send to that committee and the areas in terms of ordinance, the, the idea of yep. talking about ordinance, because those, that's what the city council would. Um, so I would be interested in Doing that. Maybe putting that on, on our future okay. community resources. All right, so we just go through these things and see who else wants to sign up, either, as Chris is saying, sort of, you know, a, a subcommittee or individually. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. Greenhouse gas emissions. And again, somebody's going to be just developing the question. We don't, we're not expecting you to come back the next meeting with a great greenhouse gas emissions. Greenhouse gas emissions, any takers? I actually want to take the something to do with the vehicle miles travel. Yeah. And just because it seems like one where we've got a straight, straightforward uh, data, yep. big data approach. And I just want to ask Prashant Shinoy to tell me who, who could do it. And he's head of computer science. So okay. Um, Intel, there was a lot of interest a few years ago. I never know what happened with, it, with big data, you know, and, and have, I was involved in a focus group now, how would they use the, the center at, in uh, Holyoke? And so I don't know who's in that space for that. That's for Sean. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, but, and with your size. I mean, I'm doing it oh, yeah. because Holyoke Gas and Electric has smart meters on all their customers. And we got a giant tranche of their data. And we built a tool that will use the type of analysis that I've been doing building by building on all of them all at once and characterizes every single residence wow. and, and points out the types, the categories of um, areas that you might look to improve them because they've got five minute or one hour. This is on building energy data. It's all building energy data. Wow. And you have your building in the city? Private? Yeah, all of uh, Anything that's got an account for the gas and electric. Nice. Because they're being a You could build a model for surrounding towns based on carbon types. Different kinds of it's things. It's possible, but it's, it's actually. I mean, the thing we learned was that it's not by housing type, and it's not by date. It's, you know, having the data lets you just say, here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the actual data on the thing, and it's, it's messy. It's, it's messy when you broaden it out. It's really good when you, when you, when you pinpoint an outlier and say, that one's got But I have this often where I have time. I go through exactly. the to give you time. No, and no, time. Right. So, so Dan, vehicle miles travel, other takers for aspects of the uh, greenhouse gas Okay, we're, we come back again in the future. So, um, carbon offset, anybody can soon play in this space? Yeah, I'll find some of that. Great, thanks, Ashley. And here, I was interested to obviously follow up with Dan or Ashley in terms of those areas. Um, building thermal load, electrification, conservation, trying to quantify this space. Hardest, what's your thing too? Um, it, it would be nice if we could collaborate yeah. and come up with the right questions. Yeah, at this stage we're just about questions, so that would be great. Okay, wonderful. Um, transportation, this is you know everything from reduction to electrification. Anybody interested in this space or some part of it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
park in this one. I'm interested in one. Okay. Anybody else besides the board? Yes. Yeah, I'm sure yeah, I'm particular on uh, biking. And so we have a team of statisticians at Amherst College who are looking at our valid bank data. This is a very small piece of this process. It's an NSF grant that's paying for some of these things. Um, and it's a very small piece, but that might help in terms of some of the stories. Okay, renewable energy costs. Okay, we're going to teleport. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to Homer. Show us the um, Waste treatment. I think that's the first one. Yeah, I'm going to go to Waste treatment. Okay, so then, you know, this will be on the agenda for the next meeting. We'll think about this. And again, one of the questions we have at some point is. You know, what are the questions? How do we move forward? And also, what's just one last question for I'll finish this. What's the data you think we need before we can finish the, the CWC regeneration plan? Right? There's something to want before you plan, and what's the longer term? It becomes an action item under that, that piece. So, so okay. The local control question was, I think, a topic that I'll work on. That's what I think was part of the regulatory thing. Right, right. Yeah, what do you get that? Okay, thank you. Um, um, also, just just to get in the minutes. I thought I thought I heard another one was education slash behavior. As but then then it's just that it was cross cutting and it should be a question of each section. Like yeah. every section should have a question about how we change habits and mm -hmm. norms and behavior. Yeah, yeah, and yet, I, and yet I think someone who's really good at education outreach. I mean, that is something. It's almost like any one of these needs to be able to draw upon the outreach yep. expert. Okay, anybody so else want that space? Yeah, so to have someone just be able to kind of understand what's possible. I mean, put it Rachel, you, possible. Yeah, sure. you have a public health background. It's kind yeah. of like a, it's a public yeah, health it's problem. Yeah, definitely a lot of public health. Kind of right. Sure. So, but the question you put, like, so with, with each tenant, what what is possible in terms of behavioral modification? Yeah, just to kind of understand, you know, what kind of effective outreach program, what makes an effective outreach program, what makes an effective behavior change program, um, that kind of, sure. that kind of mm -hmm. social pressure yeah. tapping into the delicate human psyche. Yeah. Effective <laughs> armor system. Kind of <laughs> <Yeah>. Chris, <laughs> that just reminded me because I was cheating a little bit here. Can you update the list to include our two council members? I think they are, isn't it? On the agenda? Are you looking at the agenda for today? Yeah, the agenda for today. It's got it, Alex and, and Rachel there. Down the bottom. Did you get a different? I must have a different. Mine doesn't have it. I'm really? not blind. Okay, the more recent version. I don't. I don't know why. Did you say February 13th, 2020? It does. Yeah. You know, I probably sent you a draft, Wayne. Oh, I printed that. Yeah. Okay. So, so the one we got published. Had okay. It. Okay. Perfect. Uh, Thank you. Just yeah. to clarify, did you were you thinking about outreach program for each tenant, no. or kind of in a general? What was as a general? Right. 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 Kind of the expert to go to. Type thing, yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. Okay. I want to just keep moving. So, Ashley, can we turn to you for more? Well, this this dovetails perfectly. Yeah. Um. So I requested to get on the agenda um, some time to talk about goals and kind of norms, and expectations for in meeting and outside of meeting. Um. I think with the turnover we've had and the uh, emerging energy, this seems like a really good time to do that. Um, so I've written up a document that, if there's kind of feedback, I can edit this and then I can submit it for the minutes. Um, but I thought it would be useful to just kind of couch this conversation um, within like NESC's charter and our mandate, why we're here. Um, so a sort of short <coughs> paraphrase of the charter is that NESC exists to um, assist and ensure that the city identify, develop, implement, and manage programs and policies, dot, 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 consistent with the goals of the Sustainable Northampton Plan, the city's climate change protection commitments, and other city plans and goals. So, massive kind of man mandate and set of demands, so I think it follows from that that, you know, in order to serve that Charter, we need to be informed of city projects, policies, proposals, 
that are relevant to energy and sustainability. And then as commissioners, we need to be engaged and invested in the work of NESC, um, given the scope of our mandate, the urgency of our work, and the opportunity that we have as members to accelerate the city's decarbonization, energy transition, and to bring ideas and kind of best practices to the fore. Thereby, <laughs> um, I would suggest that to meet these demands, NESC adopts the following norms and expectations related to meeting structure and commissioner responsibilities. And this is typed up so you can Do you want to project that up on the screen? Um, I could if that can be okay, done in a reasonable <coughs> Sometimes you try I, to I had to really kind of hold it when I pressed it when I yeah. when I used it last time. You have to turn on. Is it blank? Is it red to start? You might have to turn it on before you plug it in. Sorry, I didn't mean to delay it, but it could be good. To see what's on. It'd be nice for the public, so we appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, the first thing is to turn on the on-off button. Yeah, it was it was on, so maybe it's batteries. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. It's right in the chart. It's on. Oh, this one's lit up. That one wasn't lit up. Oh, okay. I think just you push it, don't hold it. You just push it. It's flashing. Okay. Shall we do that? Uh, yeah. Um, Chris, do you need to go to the network SSID and put in that? Not that I know of. No? Ben just had it, got it to work like this just tonight without doing Without it. having to do that. They did. They did it and then I think I just Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyhow, so if it doesn't work, I guess we should just go on. But, I mean, at least it's words, right? So yeah, I wasn't sure how, if I could send this out. Oh, As right. So you know, if, if, if it's something we're going to be going over in a meeting, uh -huh. certainly then you can, I can send a one way communication. You could to me, and I can prepare a handout to be handed out at the meeting. Uh, okay. I prefer not to use a plastic paper. Um, so, But on the other hand, I think you could. I think you can electronically. You can electronically send it. We've done that, certainly done that in the past. I mean, it's. Okay. So I'll send it out with the agenda. There's no response from anyone. A handout? Right. Yeah. You just don't so, talk to each other. Yeah. It's just a handout. Um, anyway, so the first uh, category is meeting structure, um, and these are the things I'm proposing, and I would love people to you know, add or subtract in this. Um, so I propose that following the public comment period, the next 10 minutes of meeting agendas uh, be reserved for updates on new and ongoing projects, and then the other city initiatives relevant to NESC. Um, this will be led by Chris with contributions for many other city officials. Chris and I had a conversation about the fact that particularly as a, um, as a public member, someone that's not on city council or employed by the city, I don't feel like I have a lot of insight into the, the projects that are going on, um, and I don't really know where to look for that information. Um, so that's a great idea. Do you, do you want feedback now, or do you want to wait? Yeah, you, you, can, you can go ahead. Why don't I get through you this topic, but, and then before I move on to the next one. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if there are instances, that would be a whole, a hell 10 minute, and then if there's a bigger update or whatever, if it only takes five, fine. Um, then there should be a standing agenda item for a report out from each commissioner on work conducted since the last meeting. The time allocation for this agenda item would be adjusted according to the assignments and reporting needs. Um, all agenda items shall have time limits and a timekeeper shall be assigned at the start of every meeting. Where relevant or possible, agenda items um, shall emerge with action items that commissioners take responsibility for tackling between meetings. Meetings conclude with a go-around of individual to-dos 
before the next meeting, and these would be recorded in the minutes. Um, and then meetings are two hours long and once per month. The commission will revisit this on a quarterly basis to determine if meeting frequency should be increased. You know, actually, I, I, so the new existing projects, I'll just mention that I was going to bring it up on the agenda and towards the end, the status updates. Um, I'm not sure if it should be every, um, let's, let's set that aside. I'm, I, I'm going to suggest a different time frame for it when sure. we get to my agenda. Sure. We can get there at the moment. Okay. Um, the next category I had was subcommittees. Um, I said that these shall be formed to collaborate on research and recommendations that would ultimately be presented to the full commission. Um, subcommittees shall adhere to open meeting law, meetings posted and held in public locations, minutes recorded, and um, containing less than or equal to three commissioners. Is that number uh, open meeting? Any committee that's charged with anything of any size is it? So that it's really the, the charge for doing it. You go out and think by yourself, it doesn't matter. But you meet with somebody who's representing you're representing us doing work, and even two people should be. Right, but that three or fewer. I know we can't exceed the majority. We have to be less than right. a majority. So on this commission, maybe we could go up to four or five. Four. 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 So that no, but my, up to five. But I agree with Wayne that if, if it's like the, if this body says you two go off and do this for us, then you actually need to host your meetings and stuff, just two people. But you have that anyway. You're you're doing yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for any number The question is where the cap I mean, is there a reason not to be four? I oh I see. Yeah. yeah. We can't go above certain. Yeah. Oh, I see. Uh, is, does it have to do with quorum? Is that an issue? If you have a yeah. so a committee of three, then you have quorum of two of you show up, and you can actually have your meeting. Well, so odd numbers are always good idea. Yeah. Oh, are subcommittees also held to quorum? Yeah. I think yep. so. As a majority of the subcommittees. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a majority of subcommittees. So if we have large okay. subcommittees, we have to make sure everyone shows up. But if we just agree that. Like without an official title, that a couple of us or four of us are going to go off and work on something for a one-month period, and not necessarily still separate work. to open meeting. It would be separate yeah. to open meeting law, but not. We don't have a stated size of this right. committee. So, so this sort of covers, like, to me, almost everything you've said, which is I haven't heard anything I don't like. I like them all. I just would want them not to be rigid rules. So we might say, yeah, a target usually is three people, but if we're working together and say four people is a good committee, or using the same thing for agenda items, you know, we're doing something that's really time critical, it means we shouldn't be doing something different. So I like them as sort of guidance that we generally follow, knowing that there's always going to be exceptions to prove the rule for so whether it's your three people or anything else. So, cool. so actually for subcommittee, just make sure the quorum is of the subcommittee. So if you have three people, you need two people in the quorum. And of course, subcommittees, unless you're going to have voting, <coughs> often if you're going to do research, you're not going to be voting anyhow, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. Right. But, um, but you still need the quorum. Yeah, still need the quorum. Yeah. If you have two people, then a quorum is two. <laughs> um. Um, okay, the next um, category I have is commissioner responsibilities. So. Um, or having meetings on time, come prepared, having read minutes in the agenda, and having completed work assigned at the previous meeting, um, commit to conducting work outside of meetings, actively volunteer for assignments and or propose research and deliverables to take on. For example, this could be identifying best practices and preparing presentations, preparing, proposing policy ideas, um, adhere to deadlines and be accountable to commitments, um, and be prepared to report up to the commission at each meeting, <coughs> which would be expected to include a recommendation or next step. I, I agree with all of that, except the, uh, the, the depends how strict you want to be about arriving at meetings on time. <laughs> in, in, in the spring semester, I can usually do it. In the fall semester, I will never be able to do it. I, I mean, I, 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 
I'm not sort of developing this document to be draconian. It just meant to be norms. So there can be, and I think you know if you let you know the chair know or let Chris know, they can be like that's that's just as good, right? Yeah, I think that's the key. Is that norm? So because there's always going to be that. You know, likewise, you know, there's some positions. There's two council representatives. There's mayors, people, and it's not like we can impeach them if they don't. Read the minutes ahead of time. So the norms would just be. How important is it to have um, regular attendance for all members? I think it's really important, but we can't necessarily impose it. Yeah. Because ultimately we can't get rid of. Uh, not that we would want to, but it's, I think it's why yeah. it's good to say, this is the norms we expect. You know, I mean, my experience from most committees is committees develop norms and etiquettes that most people follow. And so stating them is a good thing. Which is different than saying, you know, we think you should consider leaving if you miss three meetings. You know, yeah. I wanted to think about the attendance fees when we're trying to pick meetings. Mm -hmm. Just because if you have know, working around with folks who aren't usually here, yeah. different and, people. And in this commission in the past, there has been, you know, someone who's um, because of their work suddenly changed somehow, and they could not make meetings for three or four months, but they were still a valuable member. Yeah. And we were welcome, welcomed her back in when when she could start making again. The idea that Ben's got classes sometimes and he'll have to come in late sometimes doesn't mean we we're going to toss Ben off the commission. You know, so. Right. I think norms are good things and shame in this fashion. Yeah, I mean, I can just say arrive on time or, um, you know, inform the chair of that. Or you just make reasonable expectations to arrive yeah. on time. Unless you've forgotten you to get uh, Valentine's candy for your kids at Randy CBS. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Right, that one. Uh, one thing I would add is asking for help if you if the duties seem like you know if you're not able to complete the things you just yes. took on, to ask for help about them rather than feel like you have to do it mm -hmm. or fail. Yeah. This is before you're supposed to show up at the next meeting with your work finished. Then I would right. contact the chair or the vice chair and just say. Right, I guess that's that's sort of a, uh, an issue in terms of the communication between us for asking for help, but, uh, you know, uh, yeah, talk to the chair. Good more One last chair. <laughs> um, no, I'm done with the commission of responsibility section, but I, had, I just had two others. Yeah. Um, so the next category was chair responsibilities. Um, so actively solicits agenda items from commissioners, for example, sends an email um, or calendar reminder like a couple weeks prior to the next meeting. Um, seeks and invites expert speakers who can inform NASC's work. Um, appoints a rotating timekeeper at the start of each meeting. Acknowledges and gives speaking opportunity to all commissioners who are raising their hands and um, allows them to address an agenda item, ensures that commissioners' comments are concise and on point, and respects the, respectfully cuts off any commissioners who are dominating airtime, and ensures the commission's work moves forward according to established dead deadlines, will match commissioners as needed. I should know, I should have said this at the beginning, a lot of what I'm saying here we already practice, and again, this is just to kind of put norms and expectations on paper, and so we have something to reference. So I like those all except for one. I think the one I'd argue against is the timekeeper. I think that's sort of what the chair should be doing. Okay. Sort of keeping the combination going and watching the time. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just thinking that it, it could sort of give people, other members on the commission, a, a, for a more active role in the meeting. Um, and yeah, just sort of take the pressure of watching a clock off of you. So that was the reason I put it forward. Right. But I, I think it's like I watch as you go along, I watch the time constantly, uh -huh. so it's hard to be hard to coordinate in real time. Okay. Well, the, the final category was timekeeper responsibilities, so if we chose not to have a timekeeper, maybe I would add one or two of these to the chair. Um, but it just ensures that the, it's basically a supporting role for the chair. Um, ensures that the commission moves on from each agenda item within its allotted time. Ensures that agenda items are adequately progressing from deliberation to action within their allotted time period and flags for the commission when the pace needs to be accelerated. 
and finally has the authority to support the chair in keeping um, commissioner comments concise and on point. So, yeah, again, I understand that's the chair. So I guess one question for you all. So one of the things I first did as chair is start adding the time for doing it. But of course, Chris and I are talking about putting these times on. Does that process work? You know, we talked, like I said, how much time you have for this. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's for okay. yeah. I think it's valid. That people know sort of what it is that they're going to do. So, okay. mm -hmm. I'd like to say, uh, actually, for all of that, the chair and the timekeeper ones, um, uh, what you're really talking about is facilitation roles. That's how much you know. Um, and uh, groups work best when the entire group facilitates. Mm -hmm. So it's not just chair responsibilities. I think all of what you said are the responsibilities for commissioners and members to hold themselves to and to help the chair hold others to as well. Mm -hmm. I think mean, it just has to be a, a general thing for the entire commission. To, to That's control. a good point, yeah. yeah. I want to back up. I really like what you first said about having the first attendance in the meeting to give our updates past projects, future projects, and also allow us to give updates if there's kind of a lot in the city's agenda um, to say, you know, energy code just passed, you know, things are a little beyond public comments, but for us to bring uh, for updates. It's really important to be standing part of every agenda. So, relevant to time, we have about two or three minutes left on this. Um, comments, what do you want to do for you? Oh, thanks, Mike. So, Ashley, first of all, thank you for you know, the effort in doing this. And uh, as a question, maybe this will help us decide where we go. Were you looking for the commission to review this? You come back with another draft? Are you looking for adopting this, uh, incorporating it into what we already have as part of our mechanisms? Um, give me more idea. Yeah, my, my hope was that we would adopt these as norms and expectations of the commission. This would be a document that everyone would receive. It would be attached to these minutes, but then it would be something we could either put it in a Google Doc or um, have it posted on the web page. So actually, can you revise this based on the foundation today and send it to Chris so we can distribute it with the next? Yeah. yeah, we can vote on it. So is there a motion yeah. that we need today? Or? No, I think we, there's a consensus you're doing that, and then we can vote on the next meeting once we see it. Any last thing for your last meeting? Okay. Uh, so Ben is up, and we've talked about it. Either Ben or Ashley mentioned this as sort of just as a way to keep conversation going in more substance piece. We're starting with Ben, but sort of thinking about this as being a piece. Each meeting, obviously, some meetings there's going to be more earlier stuff we need to do, and some that's going to be less. So Ben, all yours. So I I wanted to put forward an idea and. Mm -hmm. um, this initially came from, the, we're having the kind of attention about aggressiveness of goals. And Gordon basically asserted, we can do this by 2030, it's no problem. And Louis said, yeah, prove it. You know, he's, and of course, in a conversation, that's very hard to do. It's a complex subject. Um, and so as I was thinking about it, it's not as easy as Gordon says, but it's not impossible. And so the question is kind of how do we get there? So because we come with a whole variety of knowledge about the subjects of HVAC and buildings, I, am, I, I wanted to have some time to explain this, at least some parts of it, with a little bit of background. So, you know, so, so for some people, this will be boring, and for some people, maybe. Ben, can I ask one request that you go through? Yeah. So I have utmost respect for you, but I'm sure there's some things where 12 bins would say the same thing, and some things where 12 bins would say different things. Can you try to highlight what's settled and what's settled? Um, like, if, oh, if TCB's architect was in the room, where are the places they agree with you and where are the places they disagree with you? Just to help us. Oh, yeah, I'll try. I haven't quite thought of it that way. Um, but I'll, I'll look at it. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 do my, okay. I'll do my best to, to try to understand. So. <sighs> This is not a bad list of, of the issues that we have, so I'm only talking about buildings, for, well, for, for the most part, but really heating and cooling. So if we think about if electrification is the goal, most everything else is already electrified unless we're talking about transportation, right? And so I'm not talking about transportation at all. So one, why focus on heating and cooling? Do we have the technology? Do we have time to implement it? 
how do we pay for it, and how can the city do something about it, because that's why we're here. Can I ask you a question? You're talking about not just city buildings, both public, private? All, bu it, all buildings, in fact, I'd extend it to <coughs> heating, and, heating and cooling uses, mm -hmm. because there are, there are a variety of things that are not specific. So this is space, air, and water, and other, other fluids? Yeah, uh, or industrial processes. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so you're covering all the sectors? Yeah. Now, not completely, but the point is, to get started, we need to kind of have a framework. And then we have to say, how can the city get involved in that? So first, why heating and cooling? So obviously, this is very general. But um, if you look at our, our consumption, you know, about a third of it's in transportation. And about well, almost two thirds is in residential and commercial energy consumption. And then industrial, a portion of that is actually buildings too. They're just industrial buildings. Um, now, if you look at our greenhouse gas emissions, most things have flatlined a bit except electricity. And that's a great story because the portion of the electricity emissions that are credited to electricity have to do with the penalty that comes from combusting anything and trying to turn a turbine. And when you are bringing in uh, electricity from Quebec for, that's, that's hydro or, or wind or solar um, or even just combusting more efficiently than we used to, you get a huge benefit because of, of, of well, Carnot efficiency and the, uh, the, the thermodynamics involved with that. If you look at, um, so this is a projection by this, uh, Jacobson and all uh, from a little while ago, and you, you can see the black section is where we are now, and, then, and they're projecting how could we possibly go forward. All of our energy use is going to wind, water, and solar. Um, and you can see that the biggest drop in usage has to do with as you switch over to wind, water, and solar, to non-combustion-based technologies, you get this huge benefit by having the, 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 you know, you don't have the huge two-thirds of the fuel value just going up into the atmosphere. So you get a whole bunch just by switching, right? Um, and then I think Jacobson significantly underestimates end-use efficiency potential. But this is in some ways a, uh, um, a, a conservative way of looking at it. And obviously, they think that offshore wind is a really big thing. So how do we actually perform recently? We're actually moving in the right direction. Is it fast enough? Well, you know. But, you know, so we have our target, and we have uh, the percent contribution uh, that's, you know, that's supposed to be increasing to 80% by 2050. But you can see that we had this big reduction in emissions that were mostly due to coal combustion. We basically stopped combusting coal. We um, stopped combusting oil. We use combined cycles with natural gas. Do I wish we were combusting less natural gas? Yeah. But, you know, so, so the part of that story is the, it's a moving target, and, and we are moving in the right direction. And it's going to be up to the entire New England grid to move us in the right direction. And we can have an impact on terminology, combined cycles? Or combined cycles. Oh, it means that first you, you have this thing like a jet engine that spins a turbine. You've now got steam. Now you can take the steam and turn, this, turn a second turbine. And now instead of only at the most getting about 34%, like maximum best old, old style uh, um, power plant you could get with 34% efficiency, now you can get up to like 44, maybe even 50% efficiency with combined cycles. They're still, you're still combusting natural gas. You're still losing half of it. What's waste combustion? Waste, oh, it means you're burning, burning, burning trash. Um, and we can, we can talk about the benefits and disbenefits of that, because there's some of both. So PV cro growth in the ISO New England region, so that's the, <coughs> ISO New England controls our, our power grid. So each of these is a forecast that they make. And what you can see is they always underpredict how much <laughs> PV there's going to be. So, I mean, that's this good part of the news that we're, we're actually overperforming what the models, and ISO New England is really good at, at predict, making projections, and they're still off and they're always conservative. Okay. 
Let's look at, so that's electricity. So look at the residential energy use. Here's the problem. For Massachusetts, we use 59% is space heating, right? And then lighting, appliances, all the electrical stuff that's naturally like, so is only a quarter of it. And most of us are heating water, not with electricity, and a little bit of cooling. And, um, you know, so 75% so of our energy use has a thermal purpose. So, and it's roughly the same with commercial. And, in fact, industrial purposes, roughly half of what industrial energy use is about is something thermal, right? You're, you're make driving chemical reactions, you're doing things that have thermal component. So we address thermal, we address a really big portion, and it's the portion that can go towards electricity, right? Just to set the table. Okay, do we have the technology? So, pretty much everybody knows there are heat pumps, they move heat from a, a, a lower quality energy state to a higher energy state. The refrigerator moves heat from inside the refrigerator to outside, etc. So, everybody likes the ductless mini split heat pumps. We had um, a heat smart program. I don't know if you'd call it successful or, yeah. or what, but you know, we, we got a bunch of we raised awareness. We raised awareness, we got a bunch of people yeah. doing it. Why doesn't every building just switch to ductless air source heat pumps and call it a day? <laughs> um, it turns out they are not the whole solution. It's just not gonna be that way. So they they don't always have a great investment return, right? It, it's still something you gotta pay for. Uh, electricity costs a lot and gas costs a little. That's a problem. Um, if you are only going to stay in your house for a few years, maybe you don't want to invest in this thing, right? Um, and this is the same for water heaters or anything else. Um, and then there's this question that was brought up a few times about stranded assets, and I want to get to that later. Um, but there's also a diseconomy of scale. As we get to some of these bigger houses, like some of our Victorians or whatever, um, it, it, you know, you, you have a different heat pump head for every single room, and now you've got to have a whole bunch of compressors. And oh, by the way, a refrigerant, which is what makes this work, is a compressible fluid, which means the longer you have to move it, the more compressor power you have to use to move it. So as we start making systems bigger and bigger, they get less efficient. And they, the, the, um, the modularity makes the marginal cost of of adding more capacity, you don't get any economy of scale from it. And quite frankly, it works best if you've got a really good house with, or a good building with a good envelope and open floor so you, so you can move stuff around. So it's not perfect for everything, and there are lots of buildings with perfectly satisfactory heating systems that just burn stuff. Then there's the system disbenefits. Um, you get the lowest efficiency at the moment of highest demand. It's the coldest out. Um, and that's also when you have the least renewable energy production, at least right now. Um, also, we're using all these refrigerants. These have a very high global warming potential. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, most of the ways we install these things are not with brazed fittings. We use mechanical fittings, which means that they can fail, and they do. That's a problem. And then the other thing is, um, probably er how many people in here have lived with an air source heat pump? So if you're operating it correctly, you kind of set it, for, set it and forget it, right? That's what we've been told. Mm -hmm. That's what you've been told because it actually works best. But that means you lose the opportunity of temperature setbacks. Back when you had a storage of some sort, like a fuel, you could actually say, well, I'm going to be away for the day, so I'm going to set this back to 60 degrees or 50 degrees. I'm gonna, I like to sleep when it's cooler, so I set it back. But when you do that, if those changes are too large, the heat pump actually doesn't function well, and you lose the benefits of what you installed. Mm -hmm. That's frustrating. Is that only on really cold days? Or is that no, cold that's day? all the time. Mm -hmm. That's in, and it has to do with the way the inverter works, and it's the ratio between the, the minimum output that this thing is capable of, and the and it's actually smaller, then it starts to short cycle. And use. Those are details, and I don't want to get into them because we can, you know. 
So but here's just, just an illustration of when the sun is shining <laughs> and, and, and your, heat, your heat loads and your sun are, are completely opposite each other. Um, and then if we look at the efficiency, now this is on energy efficiency. If we, if we use a gas heater at 97, 96% uh, efficiency, so it's a high efficiency combustion heater, um, we lose a little bit in transmission, probably maybe more <laughs> than we like to admit, but you know, but it's something. Roughly, our system efficiency is 93%, right? So we, we lost some efficiency in it. If we use a gas combined cycle turbine to make electricity, and we use and we lose some in, in in transmission, but then we have a heater, in this case, an air source heat pump, <coughs> coefficient of performance of three, or 300%. Our system efficiency is 126% efficient. We've scavenged heat from outside and got it for cheap. And that's great. But if we used an oil uh, internal combustion peaker plant, which is when what we use when it gets really cold, that's what our grid uses to add a little bit more energy. When that's running, we're back to the 93% efficiency with our air source heat pump. So the problem is, of course, that we lose efficiency as it gets colder, but that's what we're using, that, that's when we want to use our heat the most. And so if you look at these, these things, as, this, as outdoor temperature gets colder, the gas heater at some point becomes the more efficient even on a carbon basis, even with our grid. When it's, you know, around five degrees or something, you, you're actually more efficient burning a high gas at high efficiency on site as opposed to a, a, a out, on the, out on the grid. But when you're burning with an oil, you know, the peaker plant that's really inefficient, it's out of the world inefficient to be running the electricity. So this was a cold snap in 2015 over a few days. And you can see that, you know, we had nuclear power, we have a little bit less now. We had coal, we have a little bit less now. Um, but to, to make, meet the peaks in demand, and this is when most of our state does not heat with electricity, <laughs> to meet the peaks in demand, we're starting to fire up oil, uh, oil, oil fired uh, power plants. So this is a problem that is particular to, well, electrical heating of any sort, but in particular, air source heat pumps, because their efficiency gets, gets low as it gets cold. Maybe it's too much to the reach, but I know at one point Columbia Gas was looking at doing more storage of natural gas. Is, has there been any effort to replace the oil with, not the natural gas is a good solution. But um, yeah, but remember our goal here is still to get to zero yeah, yeah. carbon. So I'm just saying that it can be bad. <laughs> That's the, the mess message, it can be bad, you know. <laughs> um, but yes, they're going to be doing all sorts of stuff. But as long as we're burning, burning something, that, but burning fossil fuel, we're not getting a whole lot closer to our Okay. Um, so there are other systems that can counter counterbalance some of these disbenefits. So we have this lowest efficiency at highest demand. So instead of storing natural gas, you could just store heat. You can store it as water heated water in tanks or in the ground or with phase change materials that are kind of more heat density per, per area. Um, and you can use water to exchange with whatever heat emitters you want. Um, high global warming refrigerants, if we have a whole bunch of heat pumps and we're running refrigerant lines all over the place, we are increasing the rate at which we're using these refrigerants. Refrigerant uh, water, on the other hand, is a non-compressible fluid, which means that if I have to pump it a really, really long distance, as long as it's a closed loop and I haven't changed the head and I don't have to increase the friction, same pumping power, just cruise it along. So I can pump a really, really long distance as long as I size pipes correctly. Um, you can't do that with a refrigerant. And so that means that you can have very, very small refrigerant charges very close, just a heat pump that's doing water to water exchange, or even air to water exchange, and avoid some of those problems. Um, it also, this is still kind of in a little bit of the future, but transcritical carbon dioxide, if it leaks, it's uh, you know, got a global warming potential of one. Um, but we have to manage temperatures and pressures, and it's, it's, it's a challenge. 
Um, but we can also get the benefits of heat setbacks, right? We, which can be really, really huge. Chris can tell you that just on the municipal buildings when you set when you, any setback gives you huge savings, and we can get that because we just store stuff in a thermal buffer tank and crank up later when we need it. And these products are available. Um, that one's going into my house really, really soon. What is that? Uh, the Chiltrix chiller, just because it fits. But Space Pack, the one over there, is made in Westfield. Um, and uh, actually, the, I've got Greenfield putting one in soon. So Ben, that's a gas-fired, basically gas-fired hot water heater? Nope, that's a storage tank. Just a storage tank? It's just where's, a storage tank. Where, where's the hot water come from? The, in this particular example, the, the hot water uh, is not in the example. Yeah, um, it's just not in there. But it's very simple. In the in the case of the, this chiller, there's a valve, a three-way valve, and it goes to a heat exchanger loop in a hot water tank. Now we're getting really deep in the weeds, but it raises the temperature to 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 a, a good operating temperature, and then you f you flash you flash it higher to kill off Legionella uh, once a week. Details. So, um, but sorry, there's, this is for hot water. This yeah. makes hot water that could make that a large proportion of buildings in this area have some form of forced hot water, like, like this one here. You've got circulating water, baseboards, radiators, um, fan coils. They all use hot water. So, um, so the point is, you've got an air source, you've got a variety of them. They can offer the same efficiency. Putting hot, making hot water instead of hot air, which you can save. Um, you can also, of course, use ground source. Heat, uh, still a heat pump. This time, obviously, I grabbed it off of Arctic Killer's uh, website because they had the neatest graphics. And there's the other way you make hot water is just by um, direct heat exchange through flat plate heat exchanger. Again, with details. Is there any reason well people with wells? Yes, they can. They can. Oh yeah, there are issues with open ground exchange, but it's everything can be. In fact, that's the oldest form. So that that one's been running. There are geothermal I, I, ground exchange to ground water open wells and sites that have been operating since the 1940s. Reliable. Yeah, actually, residentially, but yes. Yeah, so residentially, that works too. Uh, off the grid. I live in Leeds too. Oh, right. Yeah. You know well? No. Yeah. I mean well. that's why I've got an air source heat pump because they're getting so efficient that the need to drill is obviated. But we can get much, much more efficient if we can use those relatively constant temperatures of the ground. So water to water heat pumps, <coughs> now instead of a coefficient of performance averaging around three something, we can be in the four or even five something. We can drop our water temperatures. We can get even higher, but that's yeah. I want to make sure I'm following. So, you, so, so the heat storage tank. You're, what you're basically doing is you're, you're using a heat pump of some kind, um, and then you're just storing the heat. You're putting it in there. It, so, so this now, is this so is you getting just, into details of hydronic design. But basically, you want your load to be able to operate on its pace. Yeah. And the supply to be able to operate on its pace. And right. The buffer tank works as a as a hydraulic separator. Okay, so you so you have heat pumps of two sizes. No, you, you got a heat pump over here and just a pump, just a circulator pump, circulating hot water. Okay. And I, like we don't have time to get into the details of hydronic design, but it's this one's showing radiant floors heating, but it can go to any of these heat emitters we've talked about. And by the way, it can also do cooling. And solar thermal fits in here. And solar thermal fits in here as well. So the problem, so it would be great if we could all have ground source heat pumps and we could drill wells <laughs> everywhere and it would be lovely, but it's super expensive. The thing is we live in a city where there are all sorts of resources. And if, you know, it, so I don't have a well, but if I could, you know, they, they paved the thing. I'm so <coughs> thankful they, they paved the road in front, of, in front of my house. It's nice and smooth. You can just glide right down it. While they were doing that, replaced, they replaced the water line, the fire hydrants, everything. It was all great. I 
covered it back up before I could get my ground exchanger in there, and, you know, when they weren't looking. And, but if I could have, you know, then I could have used the ground temperature to do it. There's a sewer line. If no one was looking, I could feed my tubes all the way down the sewer line. Maybe I could capture some heat from there. Because we're just talking about raising the temperature, so the efficiency of heat pumps is about making as small a difference in temperature, make the lift small, so you have to do less work. So there's all these resources all around our communities, and we have to just think about where they are and how do we get at them. And the cool thing about water is it's pretty consistent material, and we can meter it. We can measure the temperature, measure the flow, and we can meter it, which means we can sell the heat, or at least charge for the heat. So, uh, a lot of people, especially in Eastern Mass, where they had like explosions with gas lines, said, could we convince the gas companies to change their business model and become uh, geothermal loop operators for us? And I think to myself, well, why should we wait for them? What if we could just say, well, we own the streets. What if we could own the resources? control the resource and have it serve us. So this is a very simple idea of a line of boreholes. Instead of me having to pay to drill in my yard and do the re, uh, landscaping and all that stuff, where, well, you've got a well, but maybe it's big enough, maybe it isn't, you know, details. By spreading the cost across the, you know, the ability to re, when you're rebuilding a road or anywhere, you know, re, redoing roads anyway, to spread the cost across all of these houses, to share the cost of these boreholes, we can actually lower the total cost per individual, the same reason why most of us don't have a power plant in our backyard. Um, and, dis and hydronics allow district energy, and it can operate at lots of different temperatures, right? So we can have low temperature loops, which could just be ground temperature. We haven't raised the temperature in any way at all, to we've got some way to raise the temperature, and we can actually circulate water at a higher temperature that maybe I can use directly without even a heat pump. I can just take it right off. University, uh, Smith College have district energy systems that run on steam. There are some at high temperatures. Yeah, exactly. I've got to move along. So once we have these district energy systems, we can start thinking about efficient storage. So whether it's a PCM storage or just a big, big uh, non-pressurized tank, or a borehole field that's out some, someplace where we control it. So here's an example, and I'm going to skim over examples because we can go into the weeds. This is a, 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 a community in Alberta where they have a borehole field and there are solar panels on each of the uh, garages. These are solar thermal collectors. And all summer they're sending heat to the borehole field and it's storing up heat. And all winter they collect that heat and send it back out to the houses. Um, so they're it's just a, a grout tube, and they're all together. It's a, con it's a confined uh, site. Here's the field now. It's, it's part of their playing field. And then there's this energy center that uh, stratifies the temperature and, and moves it along. We, you get into the details. But on an annual basis, they actually put more heat into the ground than they, than they retrieve now. Um, it took a while, right? You have to build up this big thermal mass. But, um, but they have a coefficient of performance above 30. Remember I was talking about the air source heat pumps with coefficient of performance of 3? Yeah. I'm not saying this is a solution. I'm just saying it's doable and it works, and they've been doing it for 12 years. Uh, here's a different solution also in Canada. I do all my, my examples from Canada. Um, and here they're using wastewater. This is treated effluent, so it's already cooled off. Most of the heat is already gone. And they're just circulating this water because they already have it, or the heat from this water, they already have it. And, and then they've got heat pumps at each individual building. And you can see where, you know, there was, there was the heat exchanger was clogged down with that. Um, but overall, they use a whole lot less total energy, and a good portion of that's electrical, which in British Columbia is all pretty much hydro and wind power. Um, but you can do direct sewage recovery as well, where this is right outside a building. We all put out sewage from buildings. It comes out at about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you've got a little, a little raise to, to raise the temperature up. And so you can have a heat pump coefficient of performance of 5. Um, so it would be better. 
So, and this is, you know, again, I can't do this, but the city, if we take things we control and we find what's useful, you know, we can do it. So, for example, what if there were a whole bunch of solar panels on the high school? Solar, solar thermal. Solar thermal. Stuff that, you know, that, that we just own, it's right there. What if it turned out the high school needed to build a new sports field or re-turf re their sports field? Well, before we put the turf in, let's put a borehole field down in there first. Then you've got your sports field, and now look at all of that community all around that's really close that could be served with, you know, essentially this would be like the Drake Landing example. So, like, how many households or, or magnitude would a sports field? Um, it's really about the solar panels available. Um, but we can take a, a guesstimate by looking at those guys. So that's, you know, that's just the panels associated with the garage roofs to collect solar energy and a big borehole field that's not nearly as big as, as the football field. I mean, right? It's only that big. So there's a sense of scale. I mean, have I calculated that now? Plus, you can play football year round. <laughs> well, they, there's actually a whole bunch of insulation under that okay. soil. They actually do want to reduce heat loss to the right. to the sky, to the ground. You are losing heat to the ground, but it's low. Um, so, uh, it's, so, so that's just a thing to think about. This is like if the opportunity came, and instead of just putting just enough solar panels to manage our domestic hot water usage when we're washing floors in high school, for example, if we had a use for it so that we could justify covering it and then selling the heat. Cooley Dickinson, I'm usually opposed to burning biomass, but this is a good plant. The, 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 the chips would otherwise just rot and give up their carbon dioxide anyway. So they're burning wood chips, they're making steam, and, um, and in fact they could burn a lot more, there's a lot more wood available. I drove by um, uh, C.L. Frank and Co. There's a giant steaming pile of chips there, uh, rotting and not doing us any good at all. So there's a lot of just uh, available wood, but we can't burn it because the demand isn't there for cooling. But if you could extend the demand and maybe store it somewhere, you could run the Cooley Dickinson power plant driving it to try to optimize your electrical production. To try, because you always can sh shove the heat somewhere if you have a district energy system that's big enough. And in this case, you're going to try to peak your electric production to make the most money per kilowatt uh, the hour that you send to the grid. Right? And so it change how you operate it. Cooley has no interest in doing that. But if you bought their power plant and said, we're, just gonna, we're actually going to sell you heating and cooling cheaper, but we're going to run your thing to make money and save energy and, and quit. And also, you're only 75% efficient. This is, you know, 30% efficient on the combustion and, and you're, so you're losing 25% of the heating value to this guy anyway. What if we captured that heat? Again, if we had the ability to use heat at temperatures that were not steam, but had a district energy system or a borehole field somewhere. So I'm just, do I have this all engineered out? No. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole lot of waste in a system that's a good system. And look how close it is to Smith Folk, which has a field where you could store some energy. It also has a bunch of solar panels, which in the summer lose their efficiency because for every one degree above 20 degrees uh, centigrade your panel is, it loses 1% efficiency of its production. Maybe you should time check. Chris, well, do you have things with lots to generate? If, um, my elastic generator I know is flexible. Okay. And you, my five minutes are I'm going too, too slow on this. I'm going to speed up. But, but last thing, I mean, we don't, we have this room for another half hour. Do people want to stay beyond? I got something here I had north for. Okay. So, yeah. okay. so I'm going to speed up. So the point is that there's, there's other possibilities. We could get, we could get way more heat out of that Cooley Dickinson turbine if we engineered for it. Uh, this is a snapshot of downtown. All the orange is restaurants. And that's not even all the restaurants. Everyone knows there's a whole bunch of them in between there that, that you know, that didn't get flagged. Food service is the most intensive energy, uh, the energy intensive type of building. So what's most of it? It's refrigeration and cooking and there's some space heating. You'll notice that refrigeration and space heating, oh, space heating and, and water heating 
almost equal to refrigeration. Except remember, refrigeration is the electrical energy, which means it's removing twice as much energy and sending it out into the air. Cooking it with gas, uh, open gas flames, is about 40% efficient. So most of that's waste, and it's getting vented out, uh, out through, through the ventilation. We can capture that if we had a way to market it. So there's a product that just goes right onto the refrigerant line and steals the heat instead of sending it outside. It sends it into hot water heater. You can pretty much heat all the hot water that the, the restaurant needs off of the refrigerant lines. Now, not up to all those temperatures, so yes, so, so you would have to use electric resistance to bring it up. Um, okay, so the, the point is that we have a lot of resources that are just going to waste because we don't have a mechanism and, or an interested party to invest in and capturing that energy. So is there time? I want to point out that 10 years is a really short period of time and we need to get going, but it's also a long time that a lot has happened in 10 years. 10 years ago, there were no passive house, practically no passive house buildings in the US. Now, there are quite a few, and we've got a lot of builders who are actually pretty good at them and just say, that's all I'm doing now. Um, windows uh, have gotten somewhat better. Roofs, we, you know, just the worst building you're allowed to build, we went from an R38, which guarantees you ice dams, to an R49, which pretty much prevents them. You know, um, in 2008, I basically told people, heat pumps might be good someday. <laughs> you know, and now they're good. And, you know, that was 10 years. Equipment goes bad and needs to get replaced. So this gets to this whole stranded assets question. If you look at, so oil furnaces, this is U.S., I don't have data for Massachusetts, but I figured oil was a good indicator of like New England, because nobody else, you know, besides New England and New York buy oil furnaces. So you can see there's a whole bunch of them that are now at the end of their life, the bulk of them. Same with, same with boilers, the bulk of them are nearing the end of their life, and central air conditioners as well. So we have this big opportunity to replace something when somebody's going to make an investment to replace it, the better. So, replacement cycle means most will near, near end of life by 2030. It's not really stranded because heat pumps and district solutions are complemented by the legacy equipment. Up until kind of that time when we can switch it over, you, you need sometimes to get backup heat to get up to the temperatures you need. So the existing equipment that's in place is still functional. It's how we use our air source heat pumps now. And so it actually buys us a glide time, and so nobody has to throw anything away. They just have to use it less, which is good, because it'll, it, you just you drive your car less, you have to maintain it less frequently, same thing. So the problem is we need to amortize the cost of the upgrade over the equipment life cycle and not an arbitrary payback period, which is like, what, can I, what do I think I personally can stand in terms of time value of money? Then there's a sunk cost fallacy which is a little different from stranded assets. The idea with sunk costs is, I already paid for something, so I better get the full use out of it, even though I may be getting a disbenefit every time I use it. So like, I, I, I paid for this restaurant meal. It's terrible, and I think I'm sick, but I'll be <laughs> damned if I'm not going to eat the whole meal, right? That's the sunk cost balance. So as long as the heat pump or district system costs less to operate and pay for it, it's the better choice. The thing is we need to pay for this, the upgrade in increments such that the payment plus the new operating cost is less than a savings so that I can see that every day. So <coughs> this is actually one I calculated for um, across temperature ranges. So you can see um, that so I've got the natural gas price parity and the oil price parity and you can see they're at different, different temperatures. But if you look at just the oil, uh, the, the crossover to oil price parity, that's 89% of the year, the, the air to water heat pump will be the least costly one to operate. Yeah, you make a good halting point just so Chris can do his last. To... Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the municipal projects, uh, when I meant by flexibility, I do have a, a, a starter list of projects that we're working on, but that's not what I wanted to focus on. It's more like actually you were saying like once a week to spend 10 minutes on this. I was thinking that um, 
for, and I totally agree with you, that for you guys to understand what the municipality is working on is really important. And, um, uh, and, I'm, and, it, and, it, and there could be essential services, what we're working on, but I also think it should include the DPW, um, the building commissioner, um, and I heard tonight the NESC, just you guys right here, might have your own ideas to bring forward. Um, and, and, I, and I'm totally willing to start off by trying every 10 minutes, but I think what's going to happen is you're going to want some nights, you're going to want to be able to dive in more. Mm -hmm. Like right now, I have a page and a half of stuff I'm working on. I could hand that out and you could get you know, a quick little list of ideas of what I'm working on, but without really knowing exactly much about many of them. And some of them you're not going to want to know more, some of them you're going to want more in, in depth. And then um, once you hear about them, from my point of view, you're not going to want to hear about them again for six, seven, eight months. Mm -hmm. Things work slow in your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they just, you know, you're not going to want an update every, every month on this. So I was thinking it's more like quarterly updates. Although, because people are so far behind, you might want to keep it to, you know, think, well, monthly at the moment. You know, we can try to start feeding them in. Um, but eventually, kind of, Break it down to more like quarterly, just kind of maintenance um, um, updates, um, is what I think might might play out in the long run. Um, I'm, here, I'm hearing you want to, you know, monthly right now, and since we are so far behind, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, that's a catch up. And then I want to hear from you guys. Um, I mean, what's going to be more important? I have, you know, I had a list of page and a half of things that I'm working on right now. That you know, it's not 100. So when I it touches on a few things that other people are working on, but should I start off with that? And then you guys say, I want more information on, you know, number five, number six, number eight, number ten. Um, or we want to know what the DBW is doing. Um, just give me a little structure here on what's going to be the most useful. Should, should, should we kind of go in more detail on some things that we're working on? Um, or just kind of a broad list of, of things? Um, and I guess without it in front of you, that might be hard to answer. But in, in my less than five minutes, <laughs> that's what I put out here. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Sure. I was going to say, I think you know, it would be great, interesting to see that list, but I think it would be effective for you to curate each month and just give us an update what you think is most interesting or, or current related to what we're talking about um, or projects that we, that we had action or influence on you know, a few months ago that came up. So that, that would be interesting. I mean, but I'd also agree that hearing other departments. Right. Um, I, could, I, I could easily curate what, what comes out of my office. Yeah. Um, uh, what I wouldn't be able to do is like DPW, I'm often not even aware of some of the things that DPW's looking yeah. at stuff. And so you go around the room. Okay. And so maybe it's the it's the new items, and then people can flag it. I mean, if it's a quick update, five or ten minutes, whatever it is, and then people can flag this particular thing is interesting, let's put it as an agenda item in the next meeting to go mm -hmm. into detail or not. But, right. Yeah, I mean, it seems like between planning, your office, DPW, there are people five minutes or ten minutes or something. Uh, but it, it seems it's worth like holding that block on the agenda, even if all you say is no updates this month. Mm -hmm. And we have ten extra minutes for another agenda item that we're working on. But I completely agree that there's no point in you repeating yeah. things that you said last meeting. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't ask you to do that, but even if it's to say, oh, we're still trying to get through this roadblock, like no update on this project yet, or, or whatever, just so that we can stay abreast of the progress that is or isn't being made. And okay. Yep. And then if we're distributing to other relevant, you know, city offices. Okay. Yeah. And then I'll then I'll try to coordinate with the different departments. Rich, if you can help me out with the DPW, and Wayne, of course, planning, um, and Louie for the uh, buildings department. Um, Chris, I also think for the, you know, to sort of help us focus, you and me, uh, but also for the education of the commissioners over time, we can also talk about how a project's funded. We have multiple funding streams. Yeah. <coughs> we could be looking That's at right. energy management controls in this building, as an example, or we're launching a project now, I'm talking about Cooley Dickinson and Smith Folk, to develop a microgrid system for including the DPW. So we really span the gamut as far as technologies, scopes, buildings, financing, time frames. I mean, we do short-term turnaround projects, and we do multi-year projects. So and I think it would be educational and worthwhile over time to include that perspective as well as besides 
this is a project for you know Muni. We're putting energy management controls in. Well, how is it financed? How do we determine to proceed with that project, etc. So that kind of lends it to, to kind of diving in more detail and on specific projects that so you get a more fuller view. Yeah, right. sort of once we lay out, you know, here's the whole menu, which would you like to talk about? Maybe okay. entrees and dessert? Or... Yeah. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll take that back. I mean, where I was coming from in the past, I have provided feedback on, on what I'm working on, and I did find that um, uh, it was like, wow, I'm repeating myself. Um, or I don't have anything new to add um, because I've been working on the same projects I was for the last three months now. So, uh, but with that said, hold the meeting time open. If we don't use it, we don't use it. Um, and you, we will use it for, for at the beginning because there's going to be a lot of catch up here. That would be great for the public to hear this for sure. 10 minutes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so next month, um, I will start off with the starter list. I have, we don't have time for that now, but um, I will go with the starter list of projects I'm working on. And then I'll ask you guys to, which ones do you want to go in more depth on? It's hard to bring us to a close, because time-wise, but because I cut off Ben, I'll sort of think about your questions, and maybe we'll start early in the meeting if you have questions and a follow-up to Ben. Yeah. Can you yeah. didn't actually get to the main point. <laughs> no, no. no. You get no. a couple minutes. It was all we got the last few minutes in here tomorrow. I mean, what, what, I want to hear it. Yeah, we want to hear it. I'll stay as long as we don't lose quorum. Okay. I mean, I, I'll step through it faster, but yeah, this was just all to set up, you know, the question, do we have the technology? And the answer is yes, right? Um, and then get another scenario. How do we pay for it? This is what I think is the bigger thing. So that is a municipal bond rate, right? If, if you can make a 30-year uh, bond, money's pretty cheap. But for me, trying to take out a, a loan, you know, individually, it's not cheap. So if we can amortize over 30 years, because instead of me buying an air source heat pump and owning it myself, what if the municipal utility that I'm proposing exists, <laughs> buys it, owns it, it's theirs, if I move out of my house, they can take it or rent it to the next person. And so as long as my savings are big enough, I can pay the utility the cost that they're actually paying. It can pay for itself out of rental. So I did this example for someone who uses 900 gallons of oil per year. So that's kind of a lot, but you know, not unheard of. You add an air source heat pump. Some of the time the air source heat pump is the best choice. Some of the time it's not. Um, so we automate that. And so now my total cost is lower. So I've got a, almost $500 of savings. Now, this is a pretty expensive air source heat pump because it's a bigger system. And assuming you know, utilities can buy the cheaper, anyway, $6,000. Uh, what I need to do is pay $204 with 2% you know, interest on it. I charge the random 20% overhead. I don't know what the community would need to charge for overhead. But okay, 20%. I still get a savings of $252, and my monthly rent on my unit is $20, which to me is manageable. Like I can see paying $20 a month to to get $40 a month on average savings. Can um, I just throw a wrinkle on that? Yeah. So a house that's bringing 900 gallons of oil is going to need a twice that size of their source heat pump. No. No. That's, that's why I skipped over things. Unless you do efficiency. Well, no, well, that gets, we'll get to that, but this is actually using that, that uh, system. The trick is that the air source heat pump isn't efficient enough, so you size it for when it stops being efficient. You don't size it to do the whole job. That's why they're still paying for oil. No, I'm saying that if your house needs 90 gallons of oil, that the, envelope, that the loads are so high, you oh, need more than a two-head. No, no, because this isn't a, this is this is air to water. You're using you're using, oh, using the infrastructure. The you're using the ex existing infrastructure gotcha. in that in that building. You're just it's a boiler. You're just it's one component of the yeah. System. And so that's why you're still using 137 gallons of oil because because we're not to zero. But the point is we we made progress. Let's say we had a district energy loop. This is competing against gas, making it a little tougher. Um, so I actually used the same building, 
right? But I made a more efficient gas burner, and that's why it's 951 therms, um, right? So now we're using a district heating heat pump to this, uh, in this case, to a furnace. Um, but same kind of math behind it. The district heating heat pump is smaller. It doesn't have an outside component, all this stuff. So this is where we see that the monthly rent could be $14. My net annual, annual savings is smaller because I was already spending less. Um, and we have to figure out, this is where the question is, can we just charge 19 cents per therm? This is not per therm of natural gas. This is per therm of heat delivered. This is using a heat pump. If we were delivering the heat without the heat pump, you might be able to charge more because you're actually supplying more heat directly. So how could the city drive this change? Um, so I think a municipal utility would be one way to do it. You don't have a profit motive, unlike all the other utilities that want to sell natural gas. That's why they exist. In his case, shareholders are ratepayers and voters. So you want to serve them. They that they, you're going to want to keep prices low and do all those sorts of things, but if the ratepayers say, we actually really care about carbon, then they can direct their utility to do something about it. Um, you're financing with these long-term bonds, something that's available to a utility that's not available to individuals. You're in a strong position for negotiating uh, for bulk purchasing. You know, you can buy a whole bunch of these heat pumps, whatever it is. You have access to the city, connected surfaces, water, streets, etc. Um, also, and this is where the energy efficiency comes in, you now have a price on energy that the city is willing to pay, because, or the municipal utility is willing to buy efficiency. And so Seattle, for example, has a municipal utility, and they have a new ordinance that allows them to pay for energy efficiency as a service. Um, if we do municipal aggregation with electricity, we can actually tie those things together and get more insight into which buildings should be invested in to improve things. And then we have, we have all the data, all the data that we can't get a hold of. We now have all of it, and we can find out this house has a real problem. Let's fix it. Um, you can see it. So this was what I thought of as a possible timeline. This year we commissioned a study. Next year, because it's so easy, we, <laughs> we, uh, we established a municipal utility. Over that period of time, you're targeting first the, um, the oil and propane users with air source heat pumps. Um, but then you're looking at all these projects, including ones I have not thought of. The utility's job is to find these projects that can extract heat from the community that's right now being wasted and supplied where it needs to be done. Um, and so my recommendation is that this commission recommend to the city to study the municipal utility and set up a deadline for setting it up, that the city services could start to map heat sources and sinks to figure out what's actually available. Um, we can right now invest in all our municipal properties to make sure that they could actually use lower temperature water, since it's mostly hydronics, um, or other solutions where it's needed. Um, and then reach out to the community. So this is an idea that would need a lot of support to get off the ground. So figure out what people will want. Um, and then there are actually quite a few companies, including like one that I was looking up recently, Shark, which is a company that recovers heat from sewage. And they'll actually take all the risk and they'll sell heat at a competitive rate. And so there may be companies that can function as subsidiaries or contractors to our municipal utility and start developing those relationships now. That's my mind. Cool. I've been having conversations with the natural gas utilities. No. He doesn't want to. <laughs> no interest. And because of the time, yeah. and we'll, 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 I'm jumping on you. Do you want to continue this? Can we put this agenda on the next month? Continue this? That'd be great. Yeah, if you're willing to, I, I think it'd be good. I, I Can you send your background? I have conversation pieces I'd like to bring in here, but I don't think we have time for Yeah, exactly. I raced through it and like, whatever. Well, my boys will get a kick out of the idea of raw sewage heating the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I can see the jokes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.